The Public House. A place where people go to meet friends, drink alcohol, watch sports and generally have a good time away from home. But the pub as we know it is slowly dying, currently at a rate of 25 pubs a week, down from the rate seen in 2009 that saw 2,365 pubs disappear. But why are pubs slowly becoming extinct and what are pubs doing to change their fate? Some market analysts believe the increase in pub closures is due to several factors. The economic downturn, people have less money to spend, the smoking ban, alcohol duty increases, and finally, the industry failing to modernise. But what does one pub landlord think about this? Well, that, that list you've just said is absolutely right, but most pubs that have closed are, do, are not doing any of those things, um, but they're also offering nothing special. A lot of the pubs that have closed, quite frankly, deserve to close. Um, I, I don't like to see any pub close. I'm a mem long term member of Camera. We support pubs and I love pubs. But if you just study the ones that have closed, most of them tend to be badly run. Uh, you've got screaming kids running around the, behind the bar, everybody just wants to drink Carly. Um, they're not offering the general public anything. They're almost specialising in a, a very down market, nothing offering. There are, there are perhaps one or two pubs that don't deserve to shut, but generally speaking, my view is that. They're not, they've not been helping themselves and a lot of people that come into the trade they think it's easy to just stand behind the bar and serve your mates but there's a lot more to it. I'd rather go in a pub and see something individual whether it's what's on the bar, what's in the fridges behind the bar instead of seeing the same old, same old. The café has always been used in television and cinema to represent French culture and pubs have been used in a similar way to represent British culture. But are these completely accurate? So anyway, this is, so you said, anyway, so you said, uh, for a moment now I thought you were hissing my performance. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay all right. All right, yeah. Listen, uh, give me a banana dakari for um moi and um, <laughs> Australian lager for jumbo, right? Yeah. Yeah. I only sell British lager, Del. You know, Cronenberg, Offmeister, stuff like that. <laughs> right. Well, this one an evening, that's all right, right. yeah, fine. So, that's life treating you, Del. No, I'm all right, not complaining, not complaining. <clears throat> I take it you never did become that millionaire you were always talking about? Well, no, no, not, not yet, you know. <laughs> this time next year, I'll be a millionaire. Do you know those were the last words you said to me just before I emigrated? Yeah. Trouble is, that was 1967. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you know, there's, there's still time, isn't there? Still time, still time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Do you believe that, Del? I mean, I'll take it you'll be wanting a P45 with this, then. Were you ever going to tell us or not? Maybe, when there's something to tell. Well, I think there is, as soon as you didn't bother showing up today. Keep your eye on the till. You can find yourself seriously out of pocket with her around. That's what I wanted to ask you, Diane. Barring people, can I just fill my boots, or do you want asking first? Get back in your box, love. You're here to give us a good time and then clean up afterwards. Is that right? Sorry, Diane, I was just talking to your barmaid. You know what? You were right. You know that money that no one was ever going to lend me and the pub I was never going to buy? Well, guess what? They did, and I have. Have you finally had some sort of meltdown? No. Meet your new landlady. Well, co-landlady. 
So if you're ever short of cash, I'm sure I can help you out with a bit of glass collecting. And P45? Yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Now, is that everything? We're finally 15. <laughs> the age at which you're legally tall enough to order your first underage drink, innit? Ah, oh, fierce man, Ricky! So go on, then. Um, I'll have a lemonade, man. <laughs> Kiss my chuddies, man. <laughs> You're supposed to drink alcohol. Oh, whoa, 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 why's that, man? Because everybody knows, right, that hard drinking men are totally attractive to the. Rasmala! <laughs> Peggy. Carl! You tried it on and it didn't work. Well, better luck next time. Oh, one more thing. Get out of my pub. that rotten cow my special recipe for steak and kidney pudding. I felt that one for me, Pig. Well, thank you, Billy. It's nice to be appreciated. Even documentaries observing pub culture can be biased. In the name of tradition, Chris isn't keen on making many alterations to Peep Peeps. No, but now he's been cheers in the pub. If you changed it, you'd lost all the boys. It's just a car at the park. I mean, it's near a bush. Up marketplace. Well, keeping the same drinks board for decades does give Chris problems. You could fuck off for a start. It's been here for years. If you think, and I'm gonna pick off fucking things again. Pop, 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 pop. You could all pass off. There's no baby sham. There's no fucking wing. Have you seen a hairy ass semen coming in and saying, have you have a glass of wine, please? <laughs> <laughs> you got <laughs> like this coming in and said, Can I have a glass of wine? What a heap of shit! However, it appears that this cliche version of pub culture is the one that's disappearing. Hi, my name is Carlos. I work in a lime kiln in Liverpool City Centre. I'm a wine champion. That means I can recommend our wonderful wines to our customers, as well as training my colleagues about the wide range of wines that we do. Working for Wonderswins is great, the team is great, and I've learned a lot of things about wine. Now I'm happy to say I can impress my friends and family with my knowledge of wine. Pub landlords and companies are realising that if they don't change their business practice, they too could face closure. They can no longer rely on men drinking bitter in the evening to remain profitable. So what are pubs doing to avert closure? Chain companies have also adapted to the changing role of pubs, but they've taken a slightly different approach. One such company is J.D. Weatherspoons. Whilst having company-wide beer festivals throughout the year, they also moved into the coffee and breakfast market to draw an untapped potential custom. In doing so, they've become the third largest coffee seller in the UK, after Starbucks and Costa. They are also the second largest breakfast seller, after McDonald's. Some pubs have chosen to specialise in a specific area. This may be aiming for a particular social group, such as students, or installing high definition and 3D televisions to attract sports fans. The Wellington in Birmingham has decided to focus on selling a wide variety of real ales. These include popular beers, but mainly specialise in microbrewery ales that are not widely available. At any one time, it can have 16 real ales for sale, as well as three traditional ciders plus numerous bottle variations, as well as a fine selection of whiskey. Uh, I moved to Birmingham to run the Barton's Arms, mm. and I used to come into town on my night off for a beer, and there basically wasn't any. Um, it was all keg beer, 
or Guinness. So I made myself a little pact that one day I would open a real ale free house in Birmingham. And ten years later I got the opportunity to do so. And so the Wellington came about. So what has the Wellington done to avert closure and what are other pubs doing wrong? I don't know anybody that goes in these pubs that you've talked about that have closed down and stands there discussing the merits of calling. It just doesn't happen. So it's a completely different ethos and that's what makes successful free houses in particular so successful. Particularly when you've got no music, no fruit machines, people come here to enjoy beer and to have conversation. With the smoking ban approaching its fourth birthday, I was curious to find out what the original effect was for the small independent pub. But more importantly, if it was still an issue today. Uh, yes, but I'm glad to say it's a positive one. Uh, before the smoking ban, this was known as a very smoky pub. Um, so when the smoking ban came in, we were very lucky because we retained the, the existing smokers who were happy to go and have one in the, uh, the outside area. But we also attracted a lot of new clientele that wouldn't come in before because of the smoke. So our trade actually went up from the day the ban came in. A lot of pubs have focused on improving food sales by introducing children's menus and establishing club nights that focus on a particular culinary area. Well, we do something that's uh, quite unusual. We invite people to bring their own food in. And we provide uh, cutlery and plates and condiments. Tell me about the cheese nights you have. Well, that's just something we do about once every two months. Uh, we just invite people to bring a, a lump of cheese in. We provide crackers and uh, cheese biscuits, that sort of thing. And it's just such a simple idea, but it's really caught people's imagination. And everybody tries to outdo each other with a slightly better or more unusual cheese. And uh, we, we've had as many as 120 different cheeses on, on one night. With a lot of pubs and bars and even nightclubs stocking real ale thanks to its sharp increase in popularity, I wanted to know if it was just another trend like wine was during the 1990s. I don't think so. I think people are waking up to the fact that we, as a country we've got a, a wonderful beer style, traditional cask beer. There's very few places in the world that can replicate it. So it, it's unique to this country. Simply casing for a wider section of the population is only part of the changing role of pubs. They've had to adapt to the 21st century customer. One that requires internet access, one that's conscious of the environment along with how and where their food and drink is produced. A lot of new pubs now pay more attention to where they source their products and actively adopt the new Fair Trade logo. Companies are now moving into the digital realm. Weatherspoons now has an app available on iTunes as well as plugins for Google Earth that shows the locations of all its outlets. Pubs and chains are setting up Facebook and Twitter pages along with fully featured websites. This allows the customer to easily contact the people in charge, in essence bringing the company closer to the customer. It seems that pubs are adapting to a change in market, a market that is seeing a more sophisticated clientele, one that demands a better standard and more diverse range of products. Pubs now stock a large selection of wines, beers, spirits and soft drinks to attract every possible variation of customer. Large companies like Weatherspoons have successfully adopted coffee and food as a secondary if not primary source of income. Pubs like the Wellington have shown that keeping to a traditional business model can work along with some modernisation. However, there's still a question that remains. With pubs averting closure by changing their business model to adapt to a new type of customer and supermarkets now accounting for the majority of alcohol sales in the UK, does this mean the public house is now doomed to become another variation of restaurant or cafe? And who's to blame for the demise of the traditional public house? the customer who would rather buy alcohol from the cheaper supermarkets and now sees the pub as either out of date, too expensive or only desirable for weekend nights? Or is it the government for its tactical taxation and increased bureaucracy on the pub industry? Or are we simply witnessing another culture change? A change that is a stark contrast to the drinking culture seen in the first decade of the 21st century. <laughs>